So today we were talking about a very small Hunter Hunter arc, the Chairman Election arc, or the 13th Chairman Election arc. I actually read this over a much longer period of time than I would have expected because I started it right before vacation, then I wasn't reading very much on vacation, then I finished it after, and I just really hope I can do it justice because I didn't read it as succinctly as I normally would. But despite that being true, I still have a lot to say about it. I went into this arc thinking, battle to the death, the new chairman, all the hunters are, or at least a lot of the hunters, are gonna duke it out to find out who is going to be the next chairman. And then it's like, or we vote. I was very surprised. I was also very surprised that we got such a big focus on Killua and his family again. I did not expect them to come back into the story. I thought we got to know his family. I guess that's kind of stupid because in the Chimera Ant arc, dad and granddad showed back up and showed off. So I should have expected that they would get a spotlight again, but for for whatever reason, and of course, um, the youngest sibling is a part of the spiders now, a part of the phantom troop, so I guess I'm an idiot, and I should have seen that coming. I just thought that they were gonna keep playing minor roles, just show up here, show up there, add a little bit of sprinkling to the series, but I hope we get more. I hope we never stop getting more, because they are a fascinating group of people. Also, in a reading vlog, I, I said that I was going to uh, watch the anime adaptation of this arc before I review it. I lied. I have watched three episodes. I plan to continue watching it, but I'm just not a TV person, so it's just taking me a really long time, and I suck, and I'm sorry. One thing that I really liked was how each of the Zodiacs uh, are introduced as these extremely loyal members uh, of, of this group that they're in to the point that they've changed their appearances to match the nicknames that Natero gave them. Everybody except Jing and per Periston. Periston. Why did I lose his name for a second there? I think that was actually really clever, even though uh, the, the other members of the Zodiacs had decently interesting designs and I didn't get to know them at all, which is fine. I mean, it's okay to just have like a room full of side characters, but the way they were introduced and um, their very unique looks to them, I just kind of thought that they would be more important than they were. But what I really, really liked about this is that they had very unique designs based off of the Zodiac animals, everybody but Jing and Periston. And these are the two characters that end up being the major contrast in this, other than the dog lady. But Jing and Periston are such a contrast to each other in the way they interact with the, the election and what seems to be their core desires and motivations and in their very personality traits. They're such contrast to each other and it's really fun to to read the series and eventually I will be watching it back and picking up even more, I hope, um, watching them interact from their very first interaction where Periston dangles uh, the fact that Gon is in critical condition in front of him and he's like, your son's dying. Must suck for you. Maybe I should go visit him. And you get to see the kind of person that Periston is right from the start as he just like cheerfully and nonchalantly talks about how Jing's son is going to die. And then whenever Jing calls him out on it and says, yeah, maybe you should go visit him. Like he calls out his bluff. And Periston's response is to just laugh and be like, no, I don't think I will. And I really, really like that, especially now that I know more about his character. I really like to see him intentionally antagonizing Jing and Jing seeing right through it, cutting through that, calling his bluff, and then Periston having to sidestep and move on and find a different way to antagonize him. I think that that's such a great introduction to what their dynamic is gonna look like. And then from there, him just playing games, like showing up late for the meeting so that all eyes are on him, picking the most important seat at the table. Like he's just playing games around every corner in these really minor ways as well as very blatant ways. And really this part of the arc more than any other part is the part that I'm most excited to to, to watch in the anime and to see play out again now that I understand more about Periston, to see the little ways in which he was manipulating things and toying with people and kind of just get that new perspective on him. But even the first time I found him to be a really interesting character and especially with how the dog character, 
whose name I have forgotten, especially with how she was constantly analyzing him. I do think that Parasyn's character is a really interesting character, not just because of the games that he was playing, not just because of uh, his motivations and why he, what he enjoyed doing, like playing with Natero and intentionally being a blockade for him and then how he intends to do the same for the new chairman who he surrendered his position to. But I also just think that he's really interesting because he's very, he's probably a very skilled hunter, yet he was able to manipulate people, completely shake this election and, and uh, get into everybody's head and trip people up. He was able to do all of that without showing any of his men, without showing any abilities whatsoever, as far as all that goes, it was all mind games. He did it all through intellect, which I think is a really interesting character. I mean, there are characters that do everything they can to make him lose, only for us to find out at the end that he didn't care in the end about losing at all. In fact, he won because he succeeded in annoying everyone and tripping everything up and elongating the process and just being a general but about it all. It's like the most annoying kind of person because he wins no matter what because he was playing a different game from everybody else, which I think is really fun because we go from the Chimera Ant arc who had this really compelling, terrible, evil antagonist that actually started to show humanity and change, but that still had such a devastating end. And we got to discuss all these complex human emotions and complex um, <laughs> unravelings that happened in the Chimera Ant arc. And then we move on to this and our antagonist is somebody who isn't even showing his nen, someone who isn't even trying in the, in the sense that we've been dealing with up to this point. He's just a jerk. He just likes to play games and he's really good at it. And it's kind of, this is a great reprieve arc, but it's also a kind of like a reprieve antagonist that at the same time is still pretty terrifying because he also just casually has an army of ant eggs that he could use if he feels like it. He's the character that I'm the most excited to kind of re-examine as I watch through the anime for this arc um, because I just think that watching him play his games will be even more interesting the second time around now that I understand him a little bit more. Talking about other things that happened in the election side of this arc, don't worry, I'm gonna get to Killua and Aluka and all of that soon, but just real quick talking about a couple of other things that were great. I am a officially a member of the Morel fan club and watching Leorio attempt to negotiate and attempt to find the solution and not wanting to trust anybody else. And then Morel just casually saying, hand me the phone, I'm going to handle this. And I love Morel's intellect. I love his ability to just get stuff done. And I love his abil ability to do it while being completely non-fussed. And that is what he was in this arc until one moment, which is, we will talk about that. But in this arc, I also officially have joined the Leorio fan club. Man, from his defensiveness over Gon, not even wanting to share uh, someone else trying to help him because he was determined to be the one to help his friend, to his regret over not being by his side during the war, and instead he was following his own dream and also relaxing some, also partying some, but following his own dream, which is also a noble dream, but he feels guilty over not being there for his friend and he's so defensive over him, uh, calling up Karapika and saying, hey, you should be here. Like, oh man, that's amazing. But then, but then when he enters the election, calls out Jing for not being there for his son. And then when Jing, responds with nonsense, has my son requested me? No, of course he hasn't, he's dying, he can't speak right now. And so Leorio, instead of playing into that nonsense, instead of, Jing doesn't even acknowledge what he, he doesn't even, he doesn't even answer his question. Leorio asked him a question, why aren't you there? His response, well, let me ask you another question. Did my son, who cannot speak, ask for me? You fool! So what does Le Leorio do? He shows his ability by punching Jing through the table, through some portal. It was the best scene. He has my vote. And the fact that so many people voted for him just because they enjoyed seeing Jing get punched in the face so much, oh, it makes me happy. This is terribly out of order, but speaking of the Morel fan club, uh, one of my favorite scenes in this arc is when Morel, when we're in the middle of the election and Morel 
bursts in, tears running down his face just to give Leorio a thumbs up, showing him, we got here, we did it, Gon is healed. And then Gon comes in and he rushes and embraces Leorio and they hug and it's this amazing moment. I loved it. Just, just good stuff. Now, I'm really out of order. Sorry, but now let's talk about Killua and, Al and Aluka. From Aluka's first introduction, I was obsessed. I love horror elements to, st to stories. I love creepy undertones, and Aluka gave me all of that from the very beginning. From all the rules around Aluka's abilities, from the elements of equal exchange that, that come with those rules, I could feel their fear, this child that they've had that they should love, that actually genuinely terrifies them. Because sometimes their daughter's eyes go dark. Sometimes their daughter looks like she's straight out of a horror movie. They don't understand her abilities. She has these godlike powers, seemingly boundaryless powers, that they're now using their butlers to be able to test things out and try to understand her abilities. There, I could feel their fear as we're going through these flashbacks and trying to understand how Aluka works, especially as they start to realize how intense the consequences are. You know, if you wish for something giant, like to become a millionaire, then the next request or the next demand is going to be catastrophic. And if you don't fulfill those demands, it's catastrophic. And it's like, it just, I, their fear, I feel it as they're trying to sort this through. But then there are even just like really simple things like the fact that Aluka whenever, or Nanaka whenever, uh, whenever the request would be made of her and her simple response of just, okay, like that's, it was so haunting. So between Aluka's incredibly fascinating abilities, mix that with the fact that Killua, we get to see Killua in this new setting and environment where we still see his analytical, thoughtful uh, way that he, that he just assesses a situation and can usually see it from a different angle than everybody else. Plus his incredible, unwavering loyalty toward Gon, we now see it on somebody else. Mix that with the fact that we're seeing the Zol Zoldic family having these different intentions for why they want to understand Aluka. Illumi, who is wanting to understand her so that he can control her, and then eventually getting to the conclusion of, well, if I can control Killua, then I can control her too. And it's like this around every corner. <laughs> every dynamic of this was exciting, emotionally compelling, thrilling, haunting. Just in just a few chapters, I was completely hooked on this part of the arc. The dynamic between Illumi and Hisoka is also so much fun to explore and terrifying and terrible to explore. Uh, we got a little bit of them in the Hunter Hunter arc, but seeing them get to work together even more in this arc, I loved. Between how twisted and manipulative they both are, down to how powerful and a force to be reckoned with that they both are, um, they are a sickening, gross, duo of antagonists that I just don't get tired of seeing because they legitimately give me chills. And all these elements, that's not even to mention the butlers who played a huge role in the emotions of this arc. There are a lot of there are a lot of good butler scenes that I could probably talk about here, but just to keep it condensed, probably my two favorites are the one where uh, they say that, you know, they're not Killua's enemy. They're here to protect him. They want to protect him. And Killua's response is, if Aluka isn't in that list, if Al if you're not looking to protect Alu Aluka too, then you are my enemy. Loved that scene, but then also the sacrifice of that one butler with the glasses, the one that did the coin thing in the second arc, the first arc where we focused on this family. You know who I'm talking about. When he sacrificed himself, it was really good. And finally, let's talk about Gon and his dad. Again, I'm taking things terribly out of order, but there's a reason I'm doing this on purpose. So, Gon and his dad. So when he walks in and he talks to his dad and then his dad continues to be a deadbeat and he's like, oh, I'm kind of busy and I can't really talk to you. And then like the whole crowd boos him. And then when somebody even calls for, uh, for Leorio to hit him again, 
I love that scene. But speaking more about the important stuff, when Gon uh, breaks down and starts crying, he's finally met his dad. He's finally gotten to this destination and he breaks down sobbing and tells him, I failed Kite. It's my fault he's dead. And Jing's reply is, don't apologize to me, apologize to Kite. There are rules when you apologize to friends. Know what they are? You promise that you'll do better next time and then you keep that promise. So first of all, that's an amazing line. Jing sucks, but I love that line. Second of all, cutting to the scene where Gon does get to apologize to Kite in this new form, in this new body, in this reincarnated state, I still don't fully understand it. But when Gon does go to apologize, um, and I, <sighs> I really appreciate, I mean, I appreciate this entire scene, how Kite responds, I love it all, but what really stood out to me the most was that Gon didn't blame Killua. I think the line was that he should never have left Kite and it's his fault that he died because he shouldn't have ever left his side. And I think that's really interesting because the way I remember that scene is that Gon dug his heels into the ground and was ready to fight until he died. He was ready to stand by Kite's side and Killua knocked him out. Killua punched him and then carried him off. And Kite said, good. Kite said, I'm glad you did that. Good job. And then when Gon came to, he thanked Killua. He said, you assess the situation correctly. I probably would have died. You saved me. And then he told him, "I want that's what I want you to be for me. I want you to be the grounded one, the one that pulls me up when I'm not thinking clearly. And the fact that, and I know, I know that at the point that that conversation was had, Gon still had complete hope that Kite could be saved. He had no doubts in his mind that, okay, this is probably a good thing. I probably would have died there. So this is great because we can go get Kite and we can bring him back, right? So yes, there's a perspective change here, but I think it's important to note that despite all of Gon's flaws, despite everything Gon has done wrong by K Killua up to this point, in this moment where his perspective has changed, where his view on the situation and his view on how he should have handled that situation has changed, and he now thinks I should have stood by Kite's side, with all of that context, he says, I'm sorry. I should have stayed by you, even though that situation was out of his hands. He didn't make that call. Killua made it for him. And he doesn't blame Killua. That's really important to me because up to this point, Gon's been a pretty selfish character. He loves Killua, but he also takes advantage of his friendship. And he... <sighs> I have a lot of issues with the way this friendship rolls, not from a storytelling perspective, I love it, but just from looking at it from the outside in saying, y'all are pretty codependent and gone, you realize that there's a pretty big power imbalance between the two of you. You realize Killua would do anything for you and you take advantage of that. But in this moment right here, I think we see a lot of character growth from Gon, seeing that in this moment when everything has changed in his mind and he thinks that he failed Kite, he doesn't say, Killua made me leave you. He says, I left you, despite that being out of his control. I don't know, that's a big moment to me. Skipping around again, but there's a reason it's all connected. I now wanna speak about uh, when, when Killua, despite all the obstacles, <laughs> despite all the things he had to do, including telling uh, Nanaka at one point, hey, um, kill mom if I can't get out of here with you. And she's proud and oh my goodness, so many amazing little scenes in this little arc. But anyway, once they finally get away, once they finally do the chase, once they finally get through all the butlers and get through everything that uh, Ilume and Hisoka are trying to do, once they get through all of it, they get to Gon and we see a glimpse of the condition that he's in. Holy cow. When Killua and Aluka do get to Gon, to Gon and Nanaka is able to heal him and 
and then they step away and Killua then attacks, verbally attacks Nanaka and says, go away, never come back. And his goal is to protect Aluka. In his mind, I don't want Elume to be able to control you. I don't want him after you. I don't want my family after you. And I just, I wanna protect you from this other side of you, right? So he tries to banish her. He tries to get her to leave and never come back. He's trying to protect his sister. And when, when Aluka comes back out and, and scolds him and says, if you are nice to me, you have to be nice to her. You made her cry and she's so mad at him. And his response is to instantly stop and apologize. And I think this scene playing out directly after the Gon and um, Jing scene where Jing tells him the rules of when you apologize to friends is that you promise you'll do better next time and then you keep that promise. I love that immediately after Jing says that to Gon, the next, I don't know if it's the next scene, the next couple of scenes, really closely after that, we watch Killua doing that exact same thing with Alaka. We see him realizing I've messed up. I've misassessed a situation. I've misunderstood what's happening in front of me and I'm sorry. And then he devotes himself, he commits himself to protecting both of them. This is more of a character analysis point than like a scene analysis or arc analysis kind of thing, but I do find it really interesting that throughout this arc where his family calls Aluka, um, he or it, Killua, who from the very beginning, from their childhood, he asked her how her abilities work. He was the one that asked her how she felt about certain things before he made decisions for her. Like when he said, if I'm the only one that loves you, if I'm the only one that cares about you, how are you gonna feel? And she says, I'll be happier than anything else, than anyone else in the world. Um, he's the one that attempted to get to know her in any way, and he's the one that calls her she. Even when he did try to help her by getting rid of Nanaka and and Aluka tells him no that's not what I want he immediately apologizes and changes he's the only one in the family that has made any effort whatsoever to understand her as a person he's the only one in the family that made any effort to get to know her and to and to respond to her in a way that suited her, that responded that responded to her, that, that made decisions for her life based off of what she wanted. The scene that really shocked me was when Gon and Killua actually parted. I never, ever saw that coming. I thought that they were going to be together to the end of this series. And honestly, I'm still a little bit shocked. It was a very bittersweet moment. It was mostly just bitter. It was really sad. It clearly was very hard for them. And it just really surprised me. I figured even if Killua said, okay, I'm gonna stick with my sister because she needs me more. And then like, I, why wouldn't go and fight? I mean, I know he's, he's changed a lot as a character. A lot is different. And plus two, he knows that he's going in a different direction than Killua is, but it just shocked me. It just, it really, really shocked me that these two actually separated. And one thing that I, that stood out to me a lot in this codependent relationship that they have, Killua, in order for him to leave this codependent relationship, he had to enter into another relationship where another person needed so much for, from him and he had to, uh, Get, devote his life to protecting them. And this isn't me criticizing anything narratively. I love this from a storytelling perspective. This is just me as a reader observing something. And Killua is my favorite character in this series. So like, I'm not knocking anything. I'm just making an observation. I find it interesting that for Killua to leave one codependent relationship, he had to enter into another. And I'm glad he did. Aluka obviously needs him more than even Gon does, even though Gon probably needs him a whole lot still. But it is fascinating to me and I, have many, many questions still. But we will have to revisit that in a little bit because first we need to talk about Gon and his dad again. Because at the end of this arc, after he talks to Kite and he climbs the sapling tree, um, this giant, massive, baby, stunted growth tree to reach his dad, which, sir, you did not have a rope, you did not have a harness, you are a fool. Free soloing is dumb. 
you should watch the documentary Free Solo. It was amazing. So he climbs the sapling and he finally gets to talk to his dad again. And once again, from the beginning of this, of this series, Gon has been wanting to become a hunter, just like his dad did. And he has wanted to talk to his dad. He finally gets to talk to his dad. And what does he ask him? What do you want? <laughs> What's your goal? What's your purpose? What do you want, man? And his response? whatever I can have. I actually love this scene because I love that Jing isn't trying to be mysterious or deep or profound. He's literally <laughs> just saying, I want what I can't have. Basically, his excuse for being a deadbeat dad is that he doesn't know what he's doing. He doesn't know what he wants out of life. He has a general goal. He knows where he wants to go, but he's not even in a rush to do that. And he does end up saying some really great lines. Um, what is the one that I really liked? I wonder if I wrote it down. Other than the one that I've already quoted twice. You should enjoy the little detours to the fullest because that's where you'll find the things most imp more important than what you want. That's actually really great advice. But I also just really like that Jing isn't trying to put on this facade of like this really deep character. He's just really honest with gone. I wasn't around because I wasn't around. I wasn't around because I'm selfish. I mean, he's obviously an incredibly powerful character and incredibly intelligent. We learned that about him in the Greed Island arc. Yet, he's a deadbeat because he's a deadbeat. It's not more than that. He didn't leave for some noble reason. There isn't something greater about him. There's not really anything to endear us to him. He's just a bad dad. I was actually talking to my friend about this and he said that a common discussion within the fandom is who's the worst dad, Jing or Killua's dad. And I'm just gonna wholeheartedly say it's Killua's dad because I, I understand Killua's dad at least loves him, at least cares about him. It's just really twisted and messed up and he doesn't know how to be a good dad. But I'm sorry, I would take someone who doesn't care about being in my life over someone who actively tortures me any day. Now let's talk about the spoilers I got because unfortunately I did encounter spoilers while reading this arc. So I'm putting this in its own section in the video specifically because I don't want to spoil anyone else. So if you have only read up to this point and you have not encountered any spoilers, there will be a timestamp in the description for you to skip to so that you don't talk to me about this thing. So go to the description, click the link if you don't want to be spoiled. Three, two, one. Okay, so. I am aware now that Gon is done being our protagonist. I would have loved to have learned that organically, but I didn't, so oh well. I did not expect this to be the end of the series, and I did not expect us to be shifting protagonists. Even whenever Gon lost his abilities, even whenever he sacrificed being able to use Nen ever again, I was like, great, so what? So what? Are we following a man without Nen now? And even now, as they separate ways, I'm like, cool, so we're having a split perspective. We're going to follow Gon, we're gonna follow Killua, and eventually they'll find their ways back to each other. No, what? I mean, we have enough really strong characters here that I'm sure I'm still going to love this series. I'm going to love following um, Morel or Leorio or um, Karapika. Like, I, there's, there's a great, there is a great number of characters that I would be very happy to follow uh, moving forward. Shoot, we could start following the Phantom Troop again and make them our main characters again, and I would be thrilled. I would be thrilled if we followed the Phantom Troop and then encountered Killua, I mean, Karapika as an antagonist now. That would be amazing. There's so many avenues that this story could take and I would be happy. I'm just surprised, I'm so surprised. That said, I do want to speak a little bit on how I feel about this arc knowing that um, while I'm very surprised and I still have a lot of questions and I do feel like there are still some elements to Killua's arc as well as Gon's arc that I still would like to see finish out. So I really hope that we're not completely done with these characters. I hope that we're still gonna see them. I hope that we're still gonna get to see the uh, Hisoka versus Gon fight, please. <laughs> not that I want Hisoka to be in Gon's life any more than he currently is, but I'd like to see it. So I hope we're not completely done with those characters. Uh, all that said, I do think that Gon's arc, beginning with, I would like to find my dad and I would like to find out what's so great about the thing that my dad left me for. 
he's done both of those things. He joined the Hunter Association. He's become a pro hunter and a very, very skilled one. And then he lost his Nen abilities and he's met his dad and said to him what he wants to say to him. So as far as his arc goes, there's still some things that I'd like to see and there's still, I still wanna interact with him. I still wanna know what he ends up doing with his life. There's still a lot more that I wanna see from him. So ideally if he could switch to a side character instead of just leaving the series, that'd be great. But um, as far as that all goes, I do feel like it was a good place to leave him as the protagonist if that's truly what we're doing and that wasn't a false spoiler. Killua too. I would really like to see more from him. I really would like to see him with Aluka and see how they're doing and see what they end up getting up to and see him heal more and find his purpose in life. I mean, obviously taking care of his sister is now his purpose in life, but you know, more than that, more. Show me more. We get to go into the dark continent moving forward, which I'm just so excited for. I know very little, but I would love to learn more. And also the Phantom Troop, I feel like Togashi has given hints that we're not done with them. I mean, pretty big hints that we're not done with them. And the fact that we're going into the Dark Continent, I really hope that means that we're gonna get more from them. I have a lot of questions. There's a lot of things I'm looking forward to, but uh, my overall feelings about this arc are extremely positive. It did not go in any direction that I expected at all, but I have enjoyed reading it so, so much. Togashi is one of those authors that I kind of just never, can anticipate anything. It always goes in a direction that I'm not expecting, but I always come out the other side very, very satisfied. So that's, that's how I feel about this arc. Looking forward to the next one, looking forward to whatever else there is to come. I am going to continue on into the arc that is still ongoing. I I'm really, really excited to be able to read the new chapters while the rest of the fandom is reading the new chapters whenever they come. But yes, please do continue chatting with me about this in the comments. There are some scenes that I didn't even mention, so if you want to talk about them, I would love that. If there are things that you need to correct me on, always feel free to do so. Um, I post videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Tuesdays, and Thursdays on the other channel, which will be linked in the description. I'll see you again soon. Bye.